Well, good morning, beautiful Lilydalians and additional people who are joining us from all over the place, I believe. Um, welcome. It's lovely to spend Sabbath with you. And I pray that this morning this um, broadcast comes to you and you're feeling blessed by Sabbath and at peace and in God's presence. So um, I just pray that as we open the book of Acts, you feel blessed. This morning I have an ominous task of dealing with Acts 5 to 7 and it includes one of my most unfavourite pieces of scripture, my most unfavourite story about Ananias and Sapphira. And I will be skimming because it's very big. Chapter 7 alone has got 60 verses. So as Pastor Darren said, it would be important if you can join us every morning and read all the additional stuff that we don't get to do on Sabbath mornings because it's huge what's in Acts and it has so much, I call it, juice in us for, um, for us to learn. So as we look at Acts chapters 5 through 7, we find that the church is growing incredibly. It's insane. But then as we pause, we're learning some tough lessons today as well. So in this one, the church is growing, but the church is also learning some tough lessons. And we find in this particular time, in this season, there's also some subtractions. So in addition to all the additions that are coming in as in thousands, we also find some subtract, subtract, some subtractions. Interestingly, the subtractions also serve to grow the church. Let's dig in, shall we? Let's open our Bibles, if you will, to Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. I'm reading from the Passion Translation this morning. So let's read verse 1. Now, a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira likewise sold their farm. Now hang on a minute. There's a word likewise. We need to take one step back and find out what that word is actually doing there. Why have they said likewise? Obviously something happened before. So let's just back up to chapter 4, verses 34 to 37. And we find that with the explosion of the spirit within the church, you find some who owned houses and land sold them and bought the proceeds before the apostles to distribute to those without. Not a single person among them was needy. How crazy is that? For example, so Luke gives us an example now. There was a Levite called Cyprus named Joseph. He sold his farmland and placed the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. They nicknamed him Barnabas which means the encourager. We know Barnabas and we'll meet him a little bit later as we go through Acts, but here's the first introduction to him. So they had witnessed, this is Ananias and Sapphira, had witnessed someone else selling their property and getting lots of accolades for that. And maybe they wanted the same. Let's continue. Verse 2 in chapter 5. They conspired to secretly keep back for themselves a portion of the proceeds. So when Ananias brought the money to the apostles, it was only a portion of the entire sale. God revealed their secret to Peter and he said to him, Ananias, why did you let Satan fill your heart and make you think you could lie to the Holy Spirit? You only pretended to give it all, yet you hid back part of the proceeds from the sale of your property to keep for yourselves. Before you sold it, wasn't it yours to sell or to keep? And after you sold it, wasn't the money entirely yours at your disposal? You could plot. How could you plot such a thing in your heart? You haven't lied to people. You've lied to God. Well, we know as the story continues that Ananias right there at the feet of the apostles died in Peter's presence. And three hours later, his wife Sapphira went through the same thing when Peter asked her, is this the amount? And she said, yes, yeah, she lied as well. And Peter, instead of being happy of the miracle of devotion to the fledging church, there was a miracle that was very harsh on two people who simply kept some of their own money. And as a result, we read in verse 11, the entire church was seized with a powerful sense of fear of God that came over them when they heard what had happened. I bet it was. What a story. I can imagine that. Everybody would have been, what is going on? There's so much power of the Holy Spirit in our church and here this happens in amongst all of this. Um, I repeat from the first 
there's two verses that say there's a repeat sense of awe in both verse 5 and 11. Let's unpack this just a little bit. Maybe when they saw Barnabas, they saw him get lots of pats on the back. And maybe they saw his generosity and they felt drawn to receive the same kind of um, excitement by the community at, at being generous. And let's face it, they wouldn't be the first group of Christians who did something to appeal to the church. How many of us have done things just for recognition or to feel adored or to feel important or valued? We all love that. So Barnabas or Joseph, which was his real name, was a Levite from Cyprus and normally Levites weren't supposed to be landowners. Um, during Levitical law, they were told that they couldn't own land. Maybe because he was from Cyprus, it was different, it was outside Israel. I don't know. And honestly, it doesn't matter. His heart was moved to give everything that he had to the apostles. The face, the fact that he was given a nickname by the apostle as the encourager, lets us know that this guy was charitable in every way. He encouraged in words, deeds and money, it seems. Maybe Ananias and Sapphira just wanted a piece of the action. Maybe. But then they got cold feet. Maybe they realised that they might have needed a little bit of money to hold it back to make sure everything was going to be okay for their future. As Peter pointed out to them, um, they could have easily kept it. No problem. It was theirs. But the fact that they lied, and they lied to the Holy Spirit, they wanted everybody to think highly of them, and they thought they needed to lie to do it. Was the punishment too harsh? After all, how many of us sing... I surrender everything, and then we don't. How many of you sing those those beautiful songs in hymns and in hymns in church, and and we, our heart isn't with it? They're not the first Christians to have lied the, to the Holy Spirit, but was this punishment too harsh? Well, I got to thinking about that, and with, when you see how much power was bestowed by the Holy Spirit on the early church, maybe. God needed to bring this miracle of subtraction to bring about an authenticity to his church. I think of the Levitical law, how it, you know, God had taken the people out of, of, um, of Pharaoh's grasp, but he had to take all their horrible customs out of them once he took them into the, into the wilderness. Egypt needed to be removed from their heart. So maybe this is an instance when... God needed to remove something from the heart and to show it was it didn't have a place in the new Christian church to have an ego or to lie or to be not authentic to those around you, to try and lie to your fellow Christians. They weren't obliged to tell the truth to the apostles, but they were obliged to be honest with one another. And so as I think about it, death isn't the worst thing that can happen to a Christian, you know. Maybe this idea of subtraction was just to ensure that a seed that could have easily planted in the church of boastfulness, of being wanting accolades from people other than God, would have made a firm foothold had this not been stamped out at that point. So I was thinking about the responsibilities of a Christian. Christians, we have three main responsibilities to maintain personal integrity to maintain a clear conscience and to be authentic. Hypocrisy always involves someone else. If you become a hypocrite, you're always sinning against someone else. We are placed in community for a purpose and we need to be honest and accountable. Let's move on from that story. I'm kind of glad it's in the past, if you know what I mean. Let's go to verse 12. The apostles performed many signs, wonders and miracles among the people. And the believers were wonderfully united and they met regularly in the temple courts in the area known as Solomon's Porch. No one dared harm them, for everyone held them in high regard. Don't you know that they were afraid after what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Even in spite of all of that, continually more and more people overstepped that threshold of fear of what had happened to them more and more people believed in the Lord and they were added to the number. Great crowds of both men and women. In fact, when people knew Peter was going to walk by, they carried out their, their 
sick into the streets and laid down on cots and mats, knowing the incredible power emanating from him would overshadow them and healing. Heal them. Great numbers of people swarmed into Jerusalem from nearby villages and they brought with them their sick and those troubled with demons and everyone was healed. What an amazing thing. Remember what I just said about Ananias and Sapphira? With great responsibility um, and with great power comes great responsibility. So maybe God was just preparing hearts that if he was going to pour out that much power on a church, he needs to be able to trust them. Imagine everybody that was put in the, in the presence of the apostles was healed. It's mind-boggling to think how much power was flowing through the veins of the church. My goodness. I thought of Peter's shadow touching it, and I just had a look at the Greek word that they use for the shadow of people, Peter touching people. And it's the same word that they use for when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary when she became pregnant with Jesus. What an aura must have been around the apostles as they led this new fledgling church into a greater power and a greater understanding of who God was in preparation to spread the gospel everywhere. First Jerusalem, then Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. What an amazing thing. I'm reading now from Acts 5, verse 17 to 20. The high priest and his officials, who formed the party of the Sadducees, became extremely jealous over all that was happening. Oh, my goodness, can't you imagine that they were? So they had the apostles rested, <laughs> placed in chains and thrown in jail. But during the night, the Lord sent an angel who appeared before them and supernaturally opened the prison doors and brought the apostles outside. Go, the angel told them. Stand back in those temple courts, exactly where I took you out of, and preach the words that bring life. Uh, so the Sadducees would have been pretty, pretty upset. They benefited greatly from the fact that they could put fear into the Jewish community. They had the Romans stand off enough to say that they had everything under control and they had all the Jewish people in so much fear of what they could do to them that most people were subdued by their presence. This new movement of the apostles must have scared everything out of them. Their power and influence was absolutely threatened by their very presence. They were totally unafraid. They were going to publicly shame them. They are going to put them in a public prison, in chains, and the whole thing backfired. The angel of the Lord released them from prison. And when they sent, them, sent for them the very next morning, they had a rude awakening. Let's read verse 23. As they went to the prison, they sent the prison guards to go and get them. We found the jail securely locked and the guards standing by their cell. But when we opened the door, there was no one inside. Those apostles, you know, they went straight back to the same place where they'd been arrested. They had prayed for boldness and now they had it in spades. How fearful it was for the Sadducees to see so much power flowing through. They'd only had law. It never jumped off the page for them. It was not powerful at all. It was just, bleh. it was just words. And yet here they see these men, these Galileans, these gentle, gentle beings standing in boldness against everything they could throw at them. Verse 26, so the captain of the temple guard and his officers went to arrest them once again, but without using force, for they were afraid of what the people would do to them. So they thought the people would stone them. So they're now afraid. These guys must have driven them absolutely crazy. Verse 28, they said to them, didn't we strictly warn you that you were never again to teach in this name, but instead... You've now filled all of Jerusalem with this doctrine and are committed to holding us responsible for this man's death. They're too afraid to even mention the name of Jesus. Peter and the apostles replied, we must listen to and obey God more than pleasing religious leaders. They're so scared to use that name, the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. I love the comment, you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. Oh, my goodness. How I would love to stand 
guilty of filling Melbourne with the go- the go- doctrine of the good news. The apostles knew exactly where their power came from. They would please God, not man, and they continue in their boldness. Acts 5, 31 to 39. He's the one God has exalted and seated at his right hand, our saviour and champion. He is a provider of grace and the redeemer of Israel. We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God freely gives to all who believe in him. Oh, my goodness, I want that. You can just imagine the effect their boldness had on the Sanhedrin who were accustomed to wielding power and influence. Now these guys did not fear them, and there was nothing that they could do about them. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were so infuriated, they were determined to murder them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a noted religious professor, who was highly respected by all, stood up. He gave orders and sent the apostles outside. Then he said to the council, men of Israel, you need to be very careful about how you deal with these men. Some time ago, there was a man named Thaddeus who rose up calming, claiming to be somebody. He had a following of about 400 men, and when he was killed, all his followers were scattered, but nothing came of it. After him, in the days of the census, another man rose up, Judas the Galilean, who got people to follow him in a revolt. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in this situation, you should just leave these men to themselves. For if this plan or undertaking originates with men, it will fade away and come to nothing. But if this movement is of God, you won't be able to stop it and you might discover that you are fighting God all along. Oh my goodness, if our city only knew that when they oppose God, they're fighting against the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, Gamamiel was was, um, Saul of Tarsus' mentor. And the Jewish records state that the only complaint he had of Saul is he could not supply him with enough books. This man shows great wisdom. The religious authorities actually accepted his advice, but they still scowled the 12 anyway for their trouble. And so we find in verse 41 to 42, the apostles left there rejoicing, thrilled that God had considered them worthy to suffer disgrace by the name of Jesus And nothing stopped them. They kept preaching every day in the temple courts and went from house to house preaching the gospel of Jesus, God's anointed one. Oh, my goodness. Chapter 5, how breathtaking. Let's move on to chapter 6. Now we find the first organisational skills of the church. Um, And it's very interesting. Woody's going to probably get into this a whole lot more next week. But we find there's organisational organizational skills occurring there's giftedness and it's it's very exciting i'm encouraged by luke's addition of some of the perils of this fast-growing church despite the holy spirit moving like wildfire through every aspect of the work of the church some difficulties also arose and it makes me have hope for us in a fast-growing church and my goodness i want us to be a fast-growing church we see these things are true strong leadership does not always guarantee the absence of problems. Rapid growth does not excuse unmet needs. Unconcerned involvement does not require losing priorities. And number four, a large church can have a very effective ministry if we're paying attention. Acts 6 verses 1 to 4. Let's read that, shall we? During those days... The number of Jesus' followers kept multiplying greatly. But a complaint was brought against those who spoke Aramaic by the Greek-speaking Jews who felt their widows were being overlooked during the daily distribution of food. The twelve apostles called a meeting of all believers and told them, it's not advantageous for us to be pulled away from the word of God to wait on tables. We want you to carefully select from among yourselves Seven godly men. Make sure they are honourable, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will give them the responsibility of this crucial ministry of serving. That will enable us to give our full attention to prayer and preaching the word of God. I love the strong acknowledgement that every one person 
had to be full of the Holy Spirit. This, the caliber of men did not um, get discounted because they were doing a serving job. These were our first deacons. Their character was just as important as the leaders. And they saw that the, um, the care of these widows wasn't unimportant. It was very important. And so they chose men of great, great quality to do this. In 6, 5 and 6, everyone in the church loved this idea. So they chose seven men. One of them was Stephen, who was known as a man full of faith and overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Along with him, they chose Philip, um, Pro Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Phamanus, and Nicholas from Antioch, who had converted to Judaism. All seven stood before the apostles, the apostles who laid their hands on them and prayed with them, commissioning them to this ministry. I'm excited about commissioning because I'm commissioned to ministry, not ordained. So it, it it's very biblical. I'm very excited about that. So these seven guys, if you take a note note here, they're all Greeks. I love it. The Hellenist Jews were the ones who have felt mistreated by the Hebrews or the Hebrew speaking. Um, and there was favoritism in the distribution of food with their widows. So all seven men were Greek. So you notice this brilliant strategy of the apostles in choosing them. I'm not discounting that they were great men of God, but what a great way to reduce the prejudice by putting the people from the same culture in looking after them so that unfairness um, was buried by, by them looking after their own. They must have done an absolute bang-up job, you know. We never hear of this ever again. And I love that. I guess all, cheap, all church leaders could learn something here. I believe it reveals that there are seven habits of highly effective churches. Number one, listen to people. Number two, end discrimination based on language, culture, gender, gender, or social distinctions. Three, um, serve with your gift. Don't do someone else's work and let others help. Four, care for people and their needs, particularly the poor. Five, spread the word of God. Don't let that focus drop off. Six, pray often and about everything. Seven, appoint spiritual leaders or servants and approve their ministry. Great advice from Acts. Let's keep reading from Acts 6, verse 7 to 11. God's word reigned supreme and kept spreading. The number of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem quickly grew and increased by the day. I love it. Even a great number of Jewish priests became believers and were obedient to the faith. I love Luke's mention of these priests being added to the group. He causes a separation between the temple leaders, the people who actually cared for the people in the temple, and the Sanhedrin who were motiv motivated by power and wealth. In Acts 6, verse 8 to 11, Stephen appears again and it says, Stephen, who was a man full of grace and supernatural power, performed many astonishing signs and wonders and mighty miracles among the people. This upset some of the men belonging to the sect who called themselves the men set free. They were Libyans, Egyptians and Turks. They all confronted Stephen to argue with him, but the Holy Spirit gave Stephen remarkable wisdom to answer them. His words were prompted by the Holy Spirit. So the men set free conspired in secret to find those who would bring false accusations against Stephen and lie about him, saying, We heard this man speak blasphemy against Moses and God. This group or a company of, of men were liberated slaves and Stephen would have travelled around the 400-odd synagogues that were around Jerusalem at this time to feed the poor. So aside from the temple, these, sonic, these synagogues became places of spiritual and social meetings and both Jews of he Hebrew background and Hellenist background would gather and they were extremely poor. So um, to find that they had to they had to actually pay someone off to discount Stephen makes me really sad. He was feeding them. He was looking after them. So they find somebody and they would pay them off to bear witness against Stephen. Um, talk about ha biting the hand that feeds you. And it breaks your heart. I don't know if you've ever had lies told about you, 
But when you feel like you're um, powerfully following God in every way and giving your heart to him on a regular basis, it can be really, really tough to have one lie, someone lie to you. But Stephen never loses his cool. He never loses this supernatural power to see God's work in everything. And so he makes these guys so mad. They're seething. And then we talk about when he's finally dragged before the Sanhedrin, we get to hear Stephen tell the story of the Jews. And he displays an incredible gift of preaching. Not only he's a great man of God, but he's an incredible preacher as well. And he shows just an incredible knowledge of the scripture. As we listen to his um, to his sermon, which, which I think you'll need to read for yourself because it goes for 50-odd verses. It's an incredible long sermon. But... Um, the council said to him in, in chapter 6 and verse 15, every member of the Supreme Council focused, his, focused their gaze on Stephen and right in front of their eyes, while being falsely accused, his face is glowing as though he had the face of an angel. Now, we're not told if he actually glowed like Moses did when he came down the Mount, Mount Sinai from receiving um, the commandments, but it must have been an incredible sight to see this guy under such um, animosity and anger, and yet his face is glowing. So he's accused of blasphemy against the patriarchs, the prophets, and the rich Jew Jewish heritage in general. And Ca Caiaphas breaks the law of testimony when he even asks Stephen if the accusations are, are true. In the law of testimony, no one can testify for themselves. There needs to be two or three witnesses to perfect this alignment. Nevertheless, Stephen shows impeccable respect, even though he's being mistreated in this council, and launches into his amazing sermon. So we see at the start of this, in Acts 7 and verse 2, Stephen replied, My fellow Jews and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appears to our, appeared to our ancestor Abraham while he was living in Iraq and before he moved to Iran in Syria. So we see this incredible, um, I guess, respect. They're giving him absolutely no respect, no fairness, no anything, and he returns with this introduction to his sermon with great respect, my fellow Jews and fathers, and then he launches into this incredible sermon. And... You see this, in, once again, incredible knowledge of Scripture. He quotes from all over Scripture. It's amazing. But in his sermon, if you read it by yourself a bit later, because there's just so much in it, um, you will need to do that. He brings out these, these amazing themes. And he brings these out. The first one is God's presence and work are not confined to the geograph geographic confines of Israel. Two, meeting God is not limited to a man-made house of worship or any holy place. You know, when he told the story of Moses and the burning bush, Moses proved that wherever God is, is heaven on earth. That's, the, that's God's dwelling. Three, true faith does not need holy places or visible structures to thrive. It only needs the presence and the word of God. And fourthly, Israel had a terrible habit of rejecting the prophets sent to them by God and also worshipping man-made objects. How many times have you seen through the Old Testament accounts that they worshipped the gods from around the pagan countries around them and they adopted them very quickly? Even as they were coming, um, as Moses was coming down the mountain, they asked Aaron to create for them a god that they could worship. They very quickly um, rejected God and Stephen reminded them this awful habit they had. They were proved to over and over again to be stiff-necked people just like Jesus had called them. They loved their temple so much that they loved it even more than God. Solomon said, and it, completely right when he said, the God of heaven cannot dwell in any building that is made by man's hands and yet this temple became an object of their worship. Some of the Jewish writings actually say that if you haven't seen inside the temple, if you haven't seen some of the, the buildings 
to our God, you've never seen a beautiful building. So it became a great um, thing of pride for them, the grandeur and the op opulence of that. But, you know, if you remember, God was just happy in a tent. The tent tabernacle was the only one he actually asked them to build. It was David who was living in a beautiful palace who said, I can't live in a palace when God is abiding in a tent. And then his son gets to build this, this place of grandeur and opulence that, they be, that became an object of worship to the Jews. And then when Stephen closes, I love he opens with the God of glory. There's only one other place in Psalms that the God of glory is, um, is referred to in this way. And then as he closes, he sees the glory of God. So this is two bookends, the God of glory. And then he looks into heaven and he sees the glory of God. Well, let's pop down now to Acts 7, verses 54 to 60. When they heard these things, they were overtaken with violent rage, filling their souls. Um, some of the, the, the translations say they were cut to the quick and they gnashed their teeth at him. They have to be pretty mad. That's a pretty wild-looking scene, isn't it? All these people that were supposed to be composed religious leaders <laughs> at him. So you can imagine it's completely an unreal scene. This place where you're supposed to get fairness and you're supposed to be listened to is now in an absolute fit of rage and childishly gnashing their teeth at him. But Stephen, overtaken with great faith, was full of the Holy Spirit. He fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm and saw the glory and splendour of God and Jesus who stood up at the right hand of God. Look, Stephen said, I can see the heavens opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God to welcome me home. Caiaphas must have remembered when Jesus said in Matthew twenty six sixty four that he would be seated at the right hand of God. And here we see in Stephen's case, Jesus stands in a position of respect to welcome him into glory. Jesus is seated because the work is done. But in this case for Stephen, being welcomed home as the first martyr, he stands in honour of this man. He was, his words were just so frustrating to them. And don't you know it, when you're trying to be a religious um, fanatic and someone points out your sins, that it's going to drive you crazy. And that's exactly what happened in this case. His accusers covered their ears. Not only were they gnashing their teeth, with their hands and screamed at the top of their lungs to drown out his voice. Then they pounced on him and threw him outside the city walls to stone his, him. His accusers, one by one, placed their outer garments at the feet of a young man named Saul of Tarsus. As they hurled stone enough to stone at him, Stephen prayed, Our Lord Jesus, accept my spirit into your presence. He crumbled to his knees and shouted in a loud voice, Our Lord don't hold this sin against them. And then he died. I get emotional when I read that. The words of Jesus so impacted that man that he was able to stand in the presence of his accusers going through a terribly painful death of being stoned. You know, I have a theory on martyrdom that God takes the pain because you don't get burned at a stake and sing hymns. You don't have things like you read in the Fox's Book of Martyrs done to you and praise God through it. I think God is there and he takes that away. Luke takes time to mention Saul of Tarsus. Was he implying that he was part of the mob who conspired to kill Stephen? Stephen's life was so impactful to the Jewish and Christian community. It was a second death miracle in today's lesson. Ananias and Sapphira, now Stephen. Yes, I said a miracle. When someone sees Jesus sitting at God's right hand and stands in encouragement to let Stephen know, you are mine and I'm very well pleased, it's a miracle. Yes, I said the church was growing rapidly and the Holy Spirit was flooding every situation. Two death stories, neither one wonderful, but in God's maths of adding and subtracting, 
both had huge impact. Remember, death is not the worst thing that could happen to a Christian. We can learn all we can learn from all the stories of the early church, but one thing stands out. God's ways are not our ways. He sees death as something he has brought into submission. Um a tool to serve his purposes. It freaks us out. And Ananias and Sapphira will see Jesus when he comes and feel foolish for their silliness at trying to gain popularity in a fledgling church that way. But their death brought awe, huge respect to the Holy Spirit's power and a desperation for authenticity to a baby church. Stephen will see Jesus with confidence. And it will seem no time has passed at all since that last stone found its mark. And he looked into his saviour's face and saw welcome as he stood in respect of the first Christian martyr. But his death impacted so many. I see someone stand with a glowing, to see someone standing with a glowing face in that kind of environment was indeed a miracle. It turned the attention of a young man named Saul. It set a precedent that no one dies alone when they follow Jesus to death. God's power and purposes reign supreme in the early church. God's power still does. What lessons have you learned today? Can you surrender everything to this God?